crush. Okay. Body Design University personal trainer talk. It is uh, Wednesday here, 2 p.m. Eastern time. We are very excited. We've got a great lineup uh, today of questions that we are going to answer for you. So guys, just remember, whether you are just getting started as a personal trainer anywhere in this world, or you have been a personal trainer for a very long time, we are here to answer your questions, help you out no matter what that is. Now, a lot of folks have been uh, sending in questions. So we've got some great questions that we're going to answer tonight. Some folks um, are going to be joining us live and we're going to bring them in and, and have a conversation. So if you're one that just wants to submit your question, you can do that. Um, it's just body design you.com slash ask and submit your question and we'll answer those live. If you uh, want to ask your question, have a conversation, uh, we invite that. And uh, we've got a great, great lineup uh, today. Doug, what's going on, yes, big sir. guy? Yes, sir. Man, I'm excited. I yeah, know we got some good questions. Man, I just love answering questions. I really do. Yeah, yeah. Tell, why don't you tell, the, um, tell everyone what you've been doing this week? Wow, this week. Um, yeah, I've been, uh, I've been doing a lot of gardening. And finishing oh up, gosh. yeah, yeah. What, come on. what, what, Priorities. what's, is there any, anything new in the garden? Um, yeah, I got, uh, got lettuce. I got carrots are doing really well. Um, I grow a Jamaican, I grow a Jamaican green called Kalaloo. Cause if you don't know, my wife is, my wife is Jamaican. So, um, yeah, I grow, it's an, an amazing, amazing. What does uh, it taste like? Oh, I don't know how to explain it. They call it, they call it Jamaican spinach. Uh, for anybody out there that knows it, right? Kalaloo. Yeah. So uh, got that no. growing. No, sorry. I just, I just, yeah, man. It's Look, doing good. Oh, it's doing awesome. You got to grow your own stuff. You know that. You know, I have to share a photo. You told me to do this the other day and I still haven't done it, but I got to share a photo of the garden. Uh, so oh, okay. the, cool. the cucumbers, the yeah. strawberries, listen, right. it's, it's Insane. the cucumbers, the strawberries, the peppers, the tomatoes, oh, nice. the basil, the blueberry, dude, they're, they're all on fire. Yeah. Um, like, I don't know why something went into that. Soil. What, you don't even know what you're doing. I mean, you just, right. Am I right? <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so the garden, uh, has literally oh, exploded yeah. and I want to share a photo with the last class live class that we did because you know, they, they were there for the planting and yeah. man, it is just, it's really pretty cool. So I'll do that in the next one. Um, so we've got a bunch of people, uh, dropping in here. Um, we are going to, uh, get started in just a little bit. Bear with us guys. Um, couple, uh, basic things though. Um, on a more serious note, we have a couple things that are just incredibly helpful for the new trainers out there that are just getting started. For the new trainers, um, we have, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, created a NASM audiobook that is just phenomenal. And when I say we, I mean Doug, um, and an ACE uh, audiobook, uh, the most current series of NASM. The most current, which seventh edition, seventh and the edition. most current edition of Ace, the sixth edition. Six. If you're one that can't sit in front of a book, um, like me, and I love reading, but um, and Doug is going to make that reference a little bit later on the <laughs> talk. But um, if you can't sit in front of a book for you know many hours, especially when it comes to technical stuff, um, we have these audiobooks now. Literally, you can uh, just listen, and it's it's really incredible. And Doug, I, I mean, look, I'm, you you do a pretty good. I mean, you really do. I I shared the some of the audios with the team uh, this week, and <laughs> they they were pretty impressed. They were like, "He's a natural at this." Yeah, I don't know about that, but uh, but yeah, they've been they've I've already already gotten feedback um, from folks. Um, Is that right? Not just yeah, not just by listening to it, but using it in conjunction with reading it, because that's the you know that's the interesting thing is that. It doesn't have to be either or. And I think I mentioned it. Did I, did I mention it last week? You know, part of what you can do is you can you can help your brain out by doing doing multiple modalities of learning. So if yeah. you listen to it and you're reading it simultaneously, mm. um, you can actually uh, aid with retention. Remember, we always try and get people to understand where their points of frustration occur when it comes to learning. And if it's just you read and you read and it just doesn't work, we'll stop. Stop getting frustrated over it and switch your mode of learning. Uh, read it, but now listen to it as well, and you can follow along. I've done that. I've done that a lot of times. It's been very helpful um, for me. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, the audiobooks are 
Yeah. I still I still don't know how I passed the ACE exam many, many years ago. Um, but basically, <laughs> um, I, if the audiobook was available at the time that, you know, me and what you was started. That, was that like the second edition of ACE when you took it? I, honestly, I don't even remember. I, I, I wish I still had the original um, ACE textbook that I used, but um, but but anyhow, yeah, it's a it's a great tool, guys. Just so you know, uh, for those of you out there, uh, for those that are existing personal trainers right now are trying to get started, and you're going through some pain, just know we're here to we're here to help that pain. We're we're here to give a little bit of medicine every week, Wednesday at two o'clock. You're not alone if you're a personal trainer out there and you need help and you want to talk or you have a question, bring it to the table. And we're here. We're we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, we have operating personal training businesses right now, trainers all over the place, and we're here to help you. So uh, bring your questions. We're going to get started in just a second. We got a bunch of people that have dropped in, and I know a bunch of people joining us uh, live. If you you're joining us right now, uh, there should be a link somewhere where you can click, jump into the uh, Zoom uh, meeting that we have going on right now. And once you jump in, you're going to be able to uh, enter the chat and just type in the chat that you have a question and we will bring you on live. Otherwise, we're going to kind of work through some of the questions that have been uh, sent in. So, uh, Doug, you ready to get started? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So this first one um, this first one is the one that I kind of last, I, I said it was really just a great question. This is Timothy Dorsey uh, Jr. Um, he is from Alabama. And okay. his question is this, is it true that healthy foods can put you in a positive mood? That's his question. So <laughs> is it true that healthy foods can put you in a positive mood? Um, Doug, I'm gonna let you get started with that one. And I've definitely got some, <laughs> some feedback for it. So, so first of of course, we have to define what he means by healthy foods, right? So, um, so I'm going to, I'll take the first shot. Uh, healthy meaning um, vegetables, fruits, lean meats, uh, things like that. The, what we, what we uh, want folks to kind of uh, think about when they're consuming foods, right? Is, is lots organic of vegetables, and fruits, clean. Or organic, right? All of those things, water, right? Plain water right? Not going out, not fried, no trans fat. So I'm going to, I'm going to work off it from that perspective. And um, yeah, I mean, there's two, there's two ways to go about this. Number one is there is, there's relevant, there's so much relevant research that, uh, that it's really just not even uh, worth, you know, going down the line as to the research that, that actually speaks to the fact that eating a healthy diet and certain foods, now don't get me wrong, certain foods can actually help increase, um, you know, certain neurotransmitters, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about just eating clean and healthy. Well, absolutely, because it's going to change your endocrine system in, in certain ways. It'll um, modulate your insulin secretion if you don't have diabetes, right? So there's a lot, there are any number of reasons hormonally that, yeah, it can affect your mood, absolutely. Um, but there's so many other, there's so many other elements to it, right? Just the food component for sure is going to have um, a, a chemical, biological chemical uh, uh, effect on your, on your body. So from that perspective, absolutely. What do you got? Yeah. So, um, this is a great question. Uh, De uh, Timothy, thank you for it. Um, this is what I'll say is that, um, first and foremost, you ever, you ever, um, exercise and then, uh, you want to eat healthy, uh, because you're exercising, you want to kind of waste the exercise or, or vice versa, you know, you're eating healthy. So you kind of want to exercise. There's so many things that go, in hand in hand, I believe with eating healthy. So does it put somebody, can it put somebody in a positive mood? Absolutely. I believe that, you know, by eating healthy, it makes one feel good about themselves. Like they've accomplished something. They did something good for their body. And so that would change somebody's mood on how they feel about themselves. So um, my, my response is absolutely yes. Um, uh, can it, can healthy food put you in a positive uh, mood? Um, over time, eating healthy too, it, it just, what does it do? It, you know, so not just in the moment, like, can it put you in a good mood, uh, but eating healthy consistently can help keep you in a good mood. Um, because like Doug said, besides just stabilizing your blood sugar level and literally, um, you also have heard the term hangry, you know, eating healthy is eating frequently. 
right? So that's a part of eating healthy. So if I eat frequently, I'm going to be in a much better mood. If I don't have my next meal, like right now, if I don't have my next, my next meal in like the next two hours, I'm going to get hangry. <laughs> I'm going to get like, I'm going to start getting into probably a bad mood. Like a lot of you guys out there, if you don't eat and you're used to eating consistently. So there's so much to that, but uh, a great question. Uh, eating healthy, we are going to assume, like Doug said, clean, you know, organic, uh, good lean proteins, uh, fruits and vegetables, but also the right amount, the right quantity, and the right frequency. So if you do those things, it's my belief that no question, it'll put you in the right mood. So, uh, okay, great question. Thank you for that. Next one comes from JC. JC, and this is from Texas. JC from Texas. Is this the next way of education? Um, so, JC, <laughs> um, I'm not right now. I don't. Um, I'm not sure exactly. Are you talking about as a personal trainer, or just educating personal trainers? If you're talking about this talk that we're doing here on Zoom, I guess so. Yes, uh, it's probably because Doug and I have been educating uh, trainers for Doug many, many, many moons. Me, I've been helping trainers for the last just over 20 years. So we've been doing this for a while and we've never done this before. I haven't. So I guess this is the new way. I know that we're helping a lot of people uh, through this personal trainer talk. Um, we're also doing uh, sessions uh, where you know, we're uh, recording videos that um, they're able to access on their schedule at their time. So when this talk is over, people can uh, you know watch it at their leisure. Um, when it comes to, if you're speaking specifically about educating clients, yeah, uh, sure. I, I would imagine that, you know, same thing uh, that uh, as we record videos and do coaching sessions with clients, that this would be considered the next way of education. Doug, what do you think about that? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, right, the technology, if he's referring to the technology, the methodology of the way information is being put across. Yeah, of course, this is not this, this, um, this method is not new of, uh, you know, video and recordings, of course, not it's been around for for a long time, the way, the way we are doing it, where we're taking the, uh, you know, the plethora of information that we've accumulated over over the years and decades. Yeah, perhaps it is a little bit different, because what we're doing is we're taking everything that we've done, and literally continue to do to this day. And we're just saying, this is what we do. Here's what you do, do what we're doing do what we've always done. We've just been doing it longer. And we just have, you know, for, for in the most most part, we have a more, um, you know, experience doing it. So in that sense, yeah, I guess it is. I guess it is, is a little. Yeah. Bit new. But as far yeah. as the technology goes. Yeah, for sure. So. Okay, moving right along. Lindsay Wilson, Lindsay Wilson from Louisiana. Thank you, Lindsay, uh, for the question. Guys, if you are uh, in the group now, thanks for jumping in. We see everyone dropping in. If you have a question or you want to ask this question live, uh, I see Lindsay checked yes on the box. I'm not seeing Lindsay on the session. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the question for Lindsay here. Um, from Louisiana, I want to learn more about HIT workouts. So she wants it to learn more about HIT workouts. Let's give her a brief on the Q&A, I guess, uh, you know, let's give her a brief rundown <laughs> on the HIT workouts. Um, Doug, you can you can start with that one and I'll give some good feedback sure, on it. Sure, sure. So HIT meaning H-I-I-T, high intensity interval training, simply a methodology for uh, reducing the, the total amount of time spent, uh, but still maintaining high levels of volume and relative intensity in a workout. You can do it Normally it's, it's within a cardio respiratory workout, but you know, you can do hit quote hit training, um, in any mode, you can do it in resistance training, cardio respiratory, because hit training is focused on heart rate and that's all it is. So, so any type of training or any, any, um, any actual exercise program that you're doing, if you're monitoring heart rate and you're getting the heart rate up to a certain level, whatever that is and in high intensity generally means above 70, 75, 80, even higher, 85% of technically your max heart rate. If you're able to do that for a specific period of time, whether it's 10, 20, 30 seconds or a minute, and then you bring the intensity, quote intensity, via recognizing heart rate back down to a moderate level of intensity and doing that up and down, up and down, right? Increasing heart rate, 80, 85%. Bring it back down to 60, 65, whatever the case is. Um, that's technically what high intensity interval training is um, by, def by definition. Yeah. So, Lindsay, I'm going to add to the HIT training. Um, and don't quote me on this because my memory's a little blurry on this, but 
I think it was Pace University. Um, uh, if there's a Pace University, that, that name Pace is sticking out. Yeah. But there was a study. Is there? So there was a study mm-hmm. that was done. This was released. Uh, I'm going to say maybe 15 years ago, and they studied people that did cardiovascular training. This was just merely cardio, not not resistance training, weight training. I think it was just cardio. And what they did is they studied these people, and I can't remember exactly, but it was like. Uh, they studied people that did um, interval training where basically uh, for 20 minutes, uh, they took their heart rate up high and low, up high and low, up high and low. Then they studied um, another group uh, that uh, based at the same time that did uh, 45 minutes of uh, high intensity. Basically, they brought their for cardio, they brought it all the way up and, and kept it up for a long period of time. And there was another one that did uh, a lower uh, intensity for I think it was an hour for a longer period of time. And what the study uh, uh, came back w- with was basically the folks that um, uh, more or less uh, intervaled their heart rate got the better the best results. They actually lost more body fat than the folks that did 45 minutes. The folks that did an hour of, so uh, by intervaling uh, their heart rate up and down. So long ago, when I read that research or that paper, I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. I'm going to run some tests with my own clients. I did some subject testing. And and uh, so we literally changed our programming around this and have gotten incredible results. Then what we did is we said, let's bring it into the weight training. So it's, it's it's kind of like taking hit training is kind of taking that concept of bringing the heart rate up and down and bringing it into the weight training component where uh, you're doing a chest exercise or you're doing a back exercise. You're going to bring your heart rate up. And if it's, if it's low, then you're going to do a little cardio burst. So during the weight training period, the, now the entire workout, not just the cardio, we're going to bring the heart rate up. We're going to bring it down. We're going to bring it up. We're going to bring it down for the entire workout. So, um, and the best way that I've always explained this to trainers in the past, um, and to my clients is, um, imagine like when you go to a car lot and there's that sticker on the window and it says, um, basically highway miles is like, you get 20 miles to the gallon, but if you're in the city, you get like 10. Well, I've always looked at it the same way. Instead of doing uh, cardio where we bring it up or the training where we bring the heart rate up the whole time, because a lot of trainers will get their clients into weight training and cardio and the heart rate's up the whole time. Instead of bringing it up, okay, and, and burning less fuel, okay, less calories in this case, um, I'm going to bring it up and down the entire workout. So throughout the entire workout, I'm going to bring that heart rate up and down, and I want to burn I want to burn a lot more gas. And I had that backwards. Didn't I? I said 20 for highway and, and 10 for the city. That's, that's okay. Something like that. But you that's get the okay. point. Lindsay, that's a great question. I hope that um, answered a little bit uh, and, and gave you a little bit more information about HIT training. And did, she, and did she ask what what is a good way to do it? Is that what she was saying? No, she just said, I want to learn more about HIT uh, workouts. And so that's, that's the concept uh, for the most part is, you know, you're doing high interval intensity training. And, and you got to keep in mind that the concept is designed for the average apparently healthy individual. Um, you, we'll get a lot of responses back saying, well, I want to be a power lifter. Or I want to be a this, or I want to be a that. Anytime you move outside of the realm of the average apparently healthy individuals, whose main focus is on losing body fat, uh, getting into better condition, overall, overall uh, wellness increases. As soon as you move outside of that, then the, the training parameters change. Yes, we're not going to do HIT training for a power lifter, um, so to speak. It's not, sure. that's not an effective goal. That's not an effective way to accomplish those goals. But look, for 99.99%, even athletes that, that I've trained, you know, we used to call it way, way back when, we used to call it conditioning training, off-season conditioning right. training. And we always did it. We always did what is now termed um, high intensity interval training. We just called it conditioning and it depended on the athlete. So if we were yeah. training, if we were training sprint athletes, we would do high intensity interval training to train their, uh, train through their anaerobic threshold and their lactate buffering, um, um, ATP producing, uh, parameters that we'd be working on. Right. So there's a lot to it. It's really interesting. Uh, yeah. And, and Lindsay, keep in that. mind, there's always modifications, right? Uh, Doug, that she's going to make, like, you're not going to do hit training with a senior. Uh, or, uh, for example, it, it might be hit training at their level type thing. Uh, so just know that. But uh, uh, another good point, Doug, that we didn't bring up is psychologically, psychologically, yeah. it's more yeah. fun. So for the clients, Absolutely. would you rather, like, for example, uh, 
get into a groove, heart rate up and keep it there and go steady like that, or on a treadmill and just go steady like that? Or would you rather get on a treadmill or elliptical and, and skip the treadmill elliptical? Cause we don't like to do that for cardio unless <laughs> we're bring, but I'm just giving it as an example. Okay. Would you like to go up and down? where you're taking the, the, the speed and the incline up and down, it's exactly. much more fun. People will do uh, and right. show up to more workouts right. when the workouts are more fun. That's really and, it. So and great, like you, great and like question. you said it, the, the intent, the, the research, because you gotta, you gotta look at research. The research is basically comparative. It compares this up and down modulation versus what's known as steady state. So you made that reference 45 minutes of this 20 minutes of steady state. I don't know about yeah. you, man. I cannot do I can't do 20 minutes of straight, straight treadmill. You know, yeah. I got my, I got my, I got my spin bike. Dude, there ain't no way I'm doing 20 minutes on a spin bike at 70% heart rate. Right. I can't do, I can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. When the, neither, when, can, when, neither can most clients. When they uh, released, when they released that uh, research years ago, we never, we never went back. We never went back. And, and so, the research even today continues to validate the same, the same, yeah, same point. Yeah. yeah. Numbers don't lie. So that's at the end of the day. Um, okay, great. We've got a question here from uh, Caitlin. Caitlin, uh, I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to uh, give you a little notification to unmute yourself, Caitlin, and then uh, fire away with your question that I see you have here. Tell us where you're from, Caitlin. Hey, Corey, I'm uh, currently in New Brunswick, Canada right now. Ooh. Oh, cool. Welcome. Welcome. So uh, what is the temperature like? I'm just curious in New Brunswick, Canada. <laughs> it's actually really good um, right now. It's like probably 22 or 23 degrees, which is really good here for this time of year. <laughs> so what is that, Doug? Try whoa, whoa. Convert that, that for Oh, that right. 20, you guys are in Fahrenheit, my bad. I was just going to say, is that 22 Celsius? <laughs> so what is that, Doug? Yeah. What, what would be the conversion? Uh, that puts it at um, what sixty something, right? Oh, that's nice. Something like that. Okay, Caitlin, isn't that correct? I don't know, man. I'm not a math guy. <laughs> All right, Caitlin, <laughs> fire away. Tell us what you got. Um, so I was just actually wondering. Um, I tried to do the liability insurance through the NASM. Um, when they give you the option for the drop down, like it lists all the states and it's not an option there for Canada. Um, mm. I try reaching out and I don't know if you know, and I'm not trying to diss them or anything, but they're just not really that quick at responding and getting back. Um, so I was just wondering if you guys knew of any other companies um, that kind of provide that insurance to people in Canada. Yeah, for, for sure. Yeah. Um, so um, now I'm almost certain of this and, and you could double check, but I'm, I'm pretty sure both of these two companies do. Um, uh, and th this is for all the trainers out there, guys. Step one, Caitlin, thank you first for getting your liability insurance. Uh, there's literally so many trainers out there that don't take that step. And uh, it's something that Doug and I have shared for many moons. So, uh, but to answer your question, uh, next, I don't know if you've tried them yet, but uh, we've been hearing a lot uh, I mean, I'm almost certain some of our students from Canada and some of our trainers have used them. So uh, it's literally just next insurance. So check, look up next insurance. Um, a lot of times uh, they'll, they also have a drop down for the different certifications and you might be able to plug in there that you have your NASM get a discount uh, that way. Uh, give or take, I think you should expect around 200 um, for the year, give or take. Um, but uh, another one is in insure. I N S U R E your club.com. And I know it sounds club, but they do independent policies for personal trainers. So those are the two that we have recommended, uh, uh, Caitlin over the years, uh, next is new and then ensure your club. And, uh, you can check those out, but those are the two that we'd recommend as far as the NASM directly, you know, I apologize. We're not just that familiar with that. Um, as far as why it's not showing up or why you're not able to book that. But I will tell you after this call, we will, uh, we'll look into that. And if I get an answer, uh, we'll, we'll provide some information on the, on the talk next Wednesday. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Thanks so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, no, pretty good. Things are awesome. Normal. Okay. Thank you for bringing that. No sweat. Thanks. Okay. So, um, Doug, uh, we're going to have to look into that. Uh, we've got so many students now um, and, uh, you know, folks in the different countries, not just Canada, but uh, make sure that yeah. Next does uh, serve uh, those countries. Yeah, because NASM, I think NASM is, has Next as its preferred vendor for, for insurance. Okay. I'm going to look into that, Caitlin, I promise you, and uh, I'll, I'll, 
I'll bring the answer uh, next week. I know uh, no question in the U S uh, tons of trainers are using next yeah. and ensure your club.com. Those are the main, those are the main ones. So, all right, let's move on. Um, we've got Shalita Edwards, Shalita Edwards from South Carolina. Is she with us? Uh, she, now I'm going to go ahead and answer her question. And then Alyssa, thank you for that question. We're going to get to you uh, next. Um, so we've got Shalita Edwards asks, how do I train clients who are over 60 and obese correctly without causing more stress on their bodies that is effective? Wow. Another great over, question. Over 60 and yep. obese. Okay. Yep. So, the, so, so the question she's got, she's got, I guess, clients are getting ready to train clients um, who are over 60 and obese. She doesn't want to hurt them. And she's just asking, like, how do I do, how question. do I, how do, how do I do that? Uh, yeah. So, Doug, you get the first, you get the first stab at that one. Yeah, well, the contraindications are more more important for the obese than the fact that they're over 60, depending on now if they're over 70 or even even older than that, then the contraindications for exercise are going to be modified for that. But but it's the obesity part that is really the critical the critical issue here. Um, and then, of course, being older just adds to the balance and all these other issues that they may have. But um, for individuals that are that have been uh, actually clinically diagnosed, so they have a BMI of 30 or greater, um, the reality is, is that it's their physical size and the effect on their joints. So the way, uh, the amount of resistance that you're going to use has to be modified, right, right off the bat. So you got cardio and you've got your, your resistance training components. So your cardio generally low to moderate type of training intensities to get them to get them going and make sure you're not putting them on equipment that makes it uncomfortable. Um, and you know this, Corey, and you, you're probably, I'm, I'm jumping in on you. you. You'd be the first one to say a lot of the issues we face with obesity is more of, is more of the way they feel when they are in the environment. You, yeah. can't, have, you can't have obese individuals, for instance, um, going down and doing crunches, for instance. Why? Maybe they can do the crunch, but now what's the next problem? Is they got to get up. So that yeah. could be that could be psychologically um, a problem. So and it could be relatively dangerous. So obese individuals, the issue is generally mm -hmm. going to be with joints, things like that. And the goal is not to, you know, not to beat them up with heavy weights or high intensity type of uh, training. The goal is to get them consistent in their in their workouts, but also make sure that they're actually working out. Um, yeah. And so. Yeah, cool. I, I've got a, uh, you know, I've got a simple philosophy that I've used for literally 20 years in, in, in training people. And it's, it's, it's really helped uh, throughout my entire career. I, I put together a program for the day of what I'm training that day, the split routine that I'm training, no matter what, it, no matter what day it is, no matter what that routine is. And I apply it to all of my clients at a level that works for them. So when you ask, like, for example, how to correctly, what to do correctly without causing more injury, generally speaking, um, I'm going to put together a program. Now, all I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust it for that client that is over 60 and obese. So what that means is I might pull some exercises out on what I plan to do that day and what I did with my other clients. And remember, this goes, uh, same goes for an athlete. If I'm training a professional athlete or somebody that's, uh, you know, really fit, I'm just going to kick it up a notch. So I've got a program that I start with. Fundamentally, I start with, and I know it's really good for the human body, no matter if they're male or female, whether they're old or young. I know that this program is going to is good for the human body and getting results. Then I modify from there. So what you're going to do is you're going to put together your program and that you would train anyone on. And then from there, you modify it. You take exercises out or you just do it at a slower intensity level, or you do lower repetitions, or you lift lower uh, amounts of weight. So if I'm training somebody that's over 60 and obese, and I've trained hundreds of people that are, you know, that have been 60 and obese, and what I did is really pretty simple. I, I started them off as slow as you could possibly imagine. I let their body do the talking. I used my personal trainer judgment. How are they doing? what, you know, I do the talk test, the look test. I, I, you know, I see how they're responding and I, I, I move my program based on how they're doing. And so I'll add to it. I'll take away, but generally speaking, you're just going to start them off really slow. That's, that's really it. You're just going to start them off really slow, skip them some exercises. If you're going to normally do uh, some exercise, say for with a client for a minute, maybe you're only doing it with them for 30 seconds. Um, if you normally were going to do like 30 reps on a certain exercise, maybe you're only doing five reps with this this person and just 
you know, seeing how their body responds and, and going from there. Um, and if you do something that's really good for the human body period, generally speaking, it's going to be safe for everyone. Um, and, and again, if they have it, I'm not talking about somebody that has injuries, um, but if they're, if they're healthy without injuries, they're apparently healthy without injuries, then you should be able to apply most programs to everyone with the little modifications. And if they're obese and a lot of people don't realize too, is that you could be 150 pounds and obese. You know that because obesity is based on a percentage of your body fat. It's not your overall total weight. So the way it's defined, I think it's Doug, I don't know if it's 32 or 36%, but it's, it's basically as a percentage. So, um, if you, if you have somebody, you're just going to make modifications. Uh, that's really it. And Shalita, um, this is a great question. Thank you for bringing it because it shows your concern and making sure that you're not going to hurt anyone and that you want to do it right. But just know, put together a program that you would train literally yourself, that you would train an athlete, you would train somebody else on and just modify it based on that person. And you're going to do uh, just fine. And it's uh, a rule that I've practiced of simplicity but it's very effective and science is science. So I hope, I hope that helps Doug, anything else you want to plug in there? Yeah. There's always the issue of whether you're doing group training as well. So if you're doing group training versus one, you know, one-on-one -on -one training, um, there are, there are some uh, issues that you always have to keep in mind and, and we've been doing group training. So if you haven't, you haven't, have an obese individual in a group, um, that's just going to be a little bit more on you to make sure that you're, you're keeping an eye on them and the appropriate intensity levels are, um, are being watched. And like you said, the, the look test for the most part is one of the best ways, best ways to do this and preempting the workout and letting them know right from the beginning, we've always done this, which is look as, as the client that you're next to don't follow them, right? Don't, don't be so concerned about competing them. You'll, they'll do that by the way, <laughs> they'll do that on their yeah. own. Um, but we definitely want to uh, preempt that. And yes, uh, uh, make sure that they're training at the appropriate uh, level of intensity. Doug, uh, you bring up a really good point. Um, and I'll add to the group training. If that person's coming in in a group setting, you did the consultation, you really have to understand their, um, how they're feeling about themselves. I'll give you an example. I had a girl, uh, come in once, um, I had a really profound experience where, and, and so this has to do with if you're even going to put them in a group setting, because somebody that's 60, um, and, uh, you know, overweight, you've really got to understand if you have an open hour, you might want to put them in the open hour. Uh, if you're only doing group training, put them in there and then build their confidence up and get them, get them going. And then, um, you know, go from there. If you feel like they have high confidence, then you could put them into the group, but tell them in advance, in advance, not during the workout, tell them in advance that you're going to, you're going to have them skip some exercises until they're conditioned and let them know that some of the other people have been training for a little bit. So, so they feel better. I'll give you a perfect example, and this is why you never judge a book by its cover or what people say. I had a girl come in. Uh, she was um, preparing for a pageant, okay, uh, here in, in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia, and she was com uh, com uh, preparing for uh, uh, Miss Georgia USA, and um, she's com really fit, right? She's really fit, and um, you would think generally that she's going to feel really good about herself. Well, I sat down at the consultation table, and I asked all the clients in the consultation on the worksheet where do you see your fitness level on a scale from one to 10? And she told me uh, a three. <laughs> it was like a three. And I'm thinking, I'm sitting in front of a girl that's really fit. She exercises pretty much every day. And she saw herself as a three. Then, um, so how she felt about herself is a really big deal when you put these folks into a group setting. Then um, the reason why this experience was so profound is because the very next hour, I had another consultation and the, the girl was um, uh, about 60, 80 pounds overweight. And she, uh, I asked, you know, I asked a lot of questions, but I asked that same question. I said, where do you put your fitness level? And she put like an eight or a nine. And she was 60, 80 pounds overweight. So, and she was amazing uh, because right after that, I, we walked, we're walking in the studio. I've got, we've got the music playing and she starts dancing in the, in the studio and her confidence was really high. So I'm going to have no challenges putting her right into a group, but so you just, you just never know. So that, that brings up a good point, but great question. Again, we've got to move on. Shalita Edwards. I hope that was helpful in, in how to work with uh, people uh, like that. Now, uh, we've got some more questions that have popped up in here. Uh, thank you for that guys. Uh, we're going to bounce over to, uh, looks like Alyssa, Alyssa, uh, I'm going to send you a little notification. You can unmute yourself. Tell us where you're from. Tell us your question. Hi, 
Hi, it's actually Elisa. It, it looks like Elisa. Sorry, it's a little confusing. Elisa. Oh, welcome, <laughs> Elisa. Elisa. Okay. Sorry about that. Welcome. <laughs> You're good. Thank you. I'm from Colorado, originally from San Francisco. Oh, where okay. where in Colorado are you li living right now, Elisa? I'm in Colorado Springs. Whoa. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Okay, Fort Carson. Yeah, right near. Fort Carson, nice. Really cool. Okay, well, uh, Elisa, tell us, uh, what do you have for us? So my question was, how often would you integrate HIIT workouts per week into a client's program? If their main focus is weight loss, how often would you integrate HIIT, HIIT workouts per week? Yeah, um, th that's a great question. Let me ask you this. Are you doing one-on-one? -on -one are you doing, is it an online training program or is it a group training program? So is it one-on-one uh, -on -one in person, online, or is it a group sessions that you're doing? I'm actually not doing any sessions yet. Um, I'm still uh, doing the program itself, um, but this is just um, for future clients that that I would have. Yeah. Or just okay. General. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. The answer is really similar to all of them. I was just going to kind of add to that, but um, because it's a little bit, uh, the what we recommend is the same for all of them. So, for example, um, we recommend either three days a week, two days a week, or one day a week. That's basically it. So, um, the the training programs that we recommend trainers to do, and certainly you could do more. Uh, can't really do less than one, but generally three days a week. This is the offering that we recommend that you put together for clients because it's the most co common what clients want. Three, two, or one, and with that, we recommend doing hit training and that style of training in every workout. So. Our training programs that we recommend are a form of, of HIIT training where we are taking the heart rate up and down throughout the entire process. And so if they come in and they train and they select three days a week, we take all the muscle in their body and we split it over three days. So on Monday, we're doing these muscles. Wednesday, we're doing this. Friday, we're doing this. And in each one of those little programs or workouts, it's a it's a style of HIIT training. Now, if they do two days a week, we're going to do uh, a Tuesday, Thursday, upper body and lower body. But that upper body is a HIIT training session. The lower body is a HIIT training. And then if we do the one day a week, basically, it's on Saturday. It's a total, bo total body workout, and we're kind of doing HIIT. So, um, Doug, get what else can we, what else can we right. help her so, with? So to add on top of what Corey was saying, um, Elisa, what he's, what he's, what he's explaining is that those three days a week are what we would term the resistance training workout. So the recommendation is on top of those three, two or one days, you're doing cardio pretty much every day. So the recommendations for cardio respiratory training is, you know, there's the number 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous, whatever, 75 minutes of vigorous. The, the point here is that the best way to the best way to to get the gains, whether it's body fat loss um, or cardio respiratory wellness and fitness, um, is to train cardio every day. You could now we don't recommend seven days a week, but we surely would recommend. And that's look if you want to if you want to get those those changes in your body more cardio after you do your resistance training uh, sessions that have cardio in them right after you after you do it but do cardio on the other days. And by the way, whether, whether you do your cardio respiratory in a hit modality or you do it steady state, that's not really as important as quote overall level of intensity um, that a person is working at. So if you did Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you did your resistance training Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, just as a, for instance, and we do a, we do a split routine, you're doing cardio on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday after the resistance, which itself has the hit modality components to it. Um, you're then Tuesday, Thursday, and hopefully Saturday, your clients are also doing another whatever, 20, 30 minutes or plus of cardio respiratory training, which itself can be done in, in a HIT format. So the idea is that HIT, because it's high intensity, is normally equated to low volume, or there may be something like, well, what's recovery issues? You don't really have to worry uh, too much about that. Because just think of it this way, if somebody is going into sort of a, or moving towards an overtraining state, you're the trainer, you can see that. And they can tell you, you know, I'm not sleeping. Now you can pull them back and say, let's back down if that's the case. But normally, you're doing three days of resistance training or two days, and they're doing cardio on the other days, the hit, the hit um, mode of training, that way of actually training or doing the cardio, it doesn't matter. And I, I like I, we've just said, I much prefer doing high intensity where I'm going up and down with adverse steady state, but either one is good. Elisa, does that make, does all that make sense to you? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much for explaining. 
Yeah. Want to add uh, just something to that. If you heard us talk about a little bit earlier about creating simplicity and applying a program to all the clients, just keep in mind this is that when you ask the question about, you know, uh, how many times for hit training, if their goal is to lose weight, right, to lose body fat, for example, um, what we always share is that that program that we put together is going to be applied to most people, whether they're trying to lose body fat, gain muscle, improve their endurance, or, because what do we know? What do we know plays the biggest role in losing body fat? What do we know, Elisa? What plays the big what what plays the biggest role? <laughs> Nutrition, right? Got it. So you're gonna put together this program for your clients uh, to do this training, but your mind is always gonna be focused on I could train these folks all day long, I could train them five days a week, but at the end of the day, the biggest role when it comes to losing weight, losing body fat, okay, is gonna be the way that they eat. And so when you're doing the programming, just keep keep the thought as sound exercise science programming that's good for everyone, good for everybody, good for mm -hmm. all these different goals. And then you're going to focus on the fat loss uh, through their through their nutrition because that's always going to play the biggest role. But that is a great question. Elisa, thanks for being a part of this. Thank you. You got it. Um, so, uh, Doug. Uh, you, you put her on the spot there when you asked her, you know. I know. The, I know. Wow. I know I did, didn't I? But so, um, but, you know, it's funny because – we think about this often and um, there's definitely modifications that you make to training based on goals, right? So I'm going to train a, a bodybuilder is completely different than somebody I'm going to train that's an endurance athlete and, sure. and all those things. But generally speaking, for the majority of the general population where you put together a sound program that can literally be applied, you know, to all these folks. And, um, and then you're going to, you're going to dial in and, and, and coach on the nutrition that's going to play the, biggest role when it comes to losing yeah. the, yeah, the body exactly. fat or whatever. Exactly. That's right. And, and of course, unfortunately there's, there's a downplaying of nutrition when it comes to, when it comes to a lot of the larger organizations because of the, the scope of practice. And so as we've always done yeah. in athletics is we focus so much on the training, on the training, on the training that we forget that for the average person, how should you train? The answer is yes, train. Right. We can give you the best way to, you know, the best way to do it, but, but it don't folk, you know, you got to focus on it, but don't make that the priority. It's when you, because you spend an hour, maybe three, maybe four hours a week, five hours max a week on that exercise. But right. What, but what do you do in the other? It's so the eating is, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's Just, a great question. Thank you for yeah, bringing that. And, um, uh, we got another one here and, uh, Austin, I see you're in the queue. I just want to give you a heads up. You are going to be up next. Uh, we're going to dive over to Victoria, Victoria Cochran, Victoria Cochran from South Carolina. Um, I'm sorry. This is more of a statement. She's, she just puts strength training abs, <laughs> not how to strength train abs. And, uh, but it just says strength training abs. So, um, Victoria, if you're it. out there, uh, you know, Give us a more detailed question. Um, I am answering these in the the perfect queue. So um, <laughs> if you're just talking about like strength, you would just put strength training abs. You know, generally speaking, um, we uh, dedicate about five minutes. Uh, that's it uh, to core and ab exercises every workout. So over an hour, if uh, just to try to guess what your question is here, um, we generally focus on the core and the abs. And to be quite honest with you, there's been, many sessions. And when I say many, I'm talking about probably a few thousand where I was training clients. And I thought to myself, you know, I realize right now, the only reason I'm doing these ab exercises is for the clients to feel better about the workout. And so their abs feel sore tomorrow, because mm -hmm. just know this is that if they have a layer of body fat, uh, inch, or two inches in front of their abs. Look, we all have abs. Just so you know, we all have a six pack, right? We all have a six pack. We just have a different layer of body fat in front of that. And doing ab and strength, strengthening your, it's not going to affect showing that. And most people's goal is to, uh, you know, lean out. So I could have spent that five minutes coaching them on nutrition. I could have spent that five, but I wanted them to feel like we're working the abs. And that was kind of the, now don't get me wrong. Strengthening the abs, your core is very, very important. But so, um, Doug, 
give her any other tips when it comes to strength training the abs? Uh, yeah, I mean, just the standard, the standard exercises. Um, of course, one of the one of the problems with abdominal training is this idea that that you're supposed to be doing higher repetitions, right? Um, and of course, the irony is that the rectus abdominis is actually predominantly uh, type two muscle fiber. It's not in it. The rectus abdominis is not a um, endurance, although it does do a lot of isometric contraction. It's actually about 50, 50, a little bit higher on the, on the type two muscle fibers. Of course, the other core muscles are generally um, endurance based because they're isometrically designed muscles. So they stay isometric, right? So maybe higher repetitions, but don't you remember, like, don't you remember people used to be doing like a hundred crunches? 200 crunches a day. And I'm, I'm like, I, I mean, I must, I must be missing something because that's not how you quote strengthen a muscle that's muscle endurance. And even that is well beyond what is necessary to build endurance in a muscle. Um, now I don't know if, I don't know if she's asking it in regards to like performance, uh, you know, that's different, but majority of the people, when we talk about, you know, abs, they're, they want to show their abs. They, that majority of people, they want to, they want to lean out. And that's not an exercise issue. No, but check this out, Doug, you know, you remember this. I know you do too, but do you remember the client? And and I can remember it like it was yesterday. I had uh, so many experiences with this, but they come in the next day and they're like, man, that was the best workout ever. My abs are so sore. (laughs) And I'm like, we, we worked like an hour on everything else. uh, Five minutes on the abs. We did do a a couple new exercises. They're really sore, but a good trainer a good trainer will get the abs sore. Why? Because the client has got to feel progress that even though if they have a layer of body fat in front, they got to feel some that progress is happening. And even though that soreness is not truly progress, because at the end of the day, we've got to lose the body fat through cardio and eating properly, all that stuff. It's really I, important. I heard a, 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 pro, a pro bodybuilder from many years ago, from the late sixties, early seventies, who, who said he never, he never directly trained his abs. Um, because basically what he would do is he would focus on contracting the isometric contraction in his abdominals during other particular exercises. <clears throat> now, logically that, that does make sense because the abdominals, particularly the core, the core area, right. Uh, internal, external obliques, uh, rectus abdominis, transverse abdominis, those muscles are actually better designed to be isometrically contracted. That's what they do while I'm doing all of this stuff. Those guys are there to uh, hold me in place. Right. And there's some movement they go through. And he was basically saying when he do push downs, you know, tricep push down, you ever do tricep push downs? I mean, I don't know how much weight you used and like flex the abs. Is that what you're talking about? You would, you know, you got to hold yourself. And I used to do that. I used to do my push downs and I'd be, Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's because of, Hey, look, let's can can, can we keep it real for a second? (laughs) Can we keep it real for a second? Listen, if a pro bodybuilder is hitting the wind straw, hitting the winnie, okay, oh my goodness. are they? Look, I'm just keeping it oh real. Let, I just got to put it out there. But if they're if they're on the wind wow. straw, okay, they are not needing to. That's a, they they're getting a little extra assistance in losing that body fat. So anyhow, um, okay, wow. uh, we've got Austin up. Austin, let's see here. Austin, I'm going to send you notifications to unmute yourself and tell us where you're from. Fire away. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, What's sir. going on, Austin? Not much. How are you guys doing? Awesome. Doing good. What you got for us? Good, good. So my question would be for people who are getting into like the whole fitness and nutrition thing for the first time ever, um, so that you don't like basically overload them and throw a bunch of changes at them at one time. What is the first, what is the one thing that you would have somebody do first to ensure that they can keep these changes going for a long time and really sustain them? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Um, what, that's a great question. Um, let me just make sure that I understand when if training somebody that has an exercise in a long time and they come in, what is the first thing that I'm going to do with them from after they've enrolled into the uh, program and from a nutrition or from an exercise standpoint? I would say more so from like nutrition, like the one thing, because I found that like, if you, if you attempt to change every facet of your lifestyle at once, yeah. it's probably not going to work out for long. So if there was like one thing that you would have somebody change first to kind of ease them into the whole new lifestyle, what would that one thing be? I'd, I'd have them do a hundred squats right now. I'm just <laughs> Doug. Yeah. I'd have them. So check this out. Great, great question. Great question. And 
it's so important uh, for so many trainers to know this. Um, uh, I drafted a, an email template that I'd used with all of my clients and when they first started. And I didn't care if uh, they had been exercising or they hadn't exercised in a long time. It was a very similar process where I said, um, you know, I, I, I attached after getting them started, you know, I'm going to measure their body composition. I'm going to determine, you know, what their basal metabolic rate is, the thermic effect of food, their activity level, and I'm going to put together a meal plan for them. But one of the most important things is, is to explain to them that they don't, they don't I don't want them to try to go from zero to 60 in like, you know, one week. So I, I would, I would give them the meal plan with the uh, recommendations. Okay. And everyone out there that's listening, follow the rules and regs in your state. But I would give them a, a, a meal plan with the reg, with the recommendations, and I would tell them that look, just uh, over a week, over two weeks max, I want you to slowly go. So let's, if I know that that client, for example, which is the most common in a lot of uh, the U.S. and Canada, for example, is that people will eat two meals. Well, if I know that they they're only consuming two meals, I'm going to say what I want you to do is I want you to start off with four meals meaning, uh, you know, including the snacks. So, you know, uh, maybe two meals, two snacks, and then uh, the next week, maybe try to get them to five. And then ultimately I want to get them to six. I want them to have three meals and three snacks. That's realistically, you know, what we want to do. So when you ask, what is the one thing getting somebody started that I would recommend? And, uh, after I put together the meal plan, I would recommend Austin that you speak to the client and uh, encourage them and tell them how excited you are to have them as a new client and just let them know that you're not expecting that you, they're going to be perfect in the first week or two and that they're going to have everything down. Just remember what they said to you in the consultation and then say, I want you to go from here and make those little baby steps. Uh, often we call those mini goals. So we say our first goal is this, get them to achieve that. If you can get them to achieve that small goal, even if they see no results, but in the first week they ate three meals instead of two, then they're going to feel accomplished and then they're going to move to the next one. And then you're going to move them to the next one. So generally uh, that would be my, my recommendation. Uh, Doug, what, what do you got for them? Well, all I know is that if you, if you were my trainer, you just, you, you would scare me too much. So I'm, you know, I, Sometimes oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would, yeah, I would, I would add on to that. Um, there's, there's something just to always keep in mind as soon as you meet somebody and they have made that, they've made that actual attempt to make some changes in their life. So, you know, first of all, it's a high five, congratulations. But the key, what I've always done is I always try to make sure that very first time they, they met me and whatever, if I worked out, whatever the, whatever the case was, I just wanted to make sure they knew that I was probably more interested in helping them than they were in themselves. So mm. when you take, look, you've got to, you've got to take interest in these people that are paying you money to do things that you should be doing anyway, as a trainer, you're, you're living that lifestyle. You're living, you should be living the lifestyle. You know how it works. You know, the benefits of it, man. I am so excited that this person came in is actually so what's the one to... thing, Doug, what's the one thing that you're going to tell him to do with that client that's just getting started? What's the one recommendation that you would make? Trust, trust me, right? Trust that you made the right decision and I'm going to help you through this, through this process. You got to trust mm -hmm. me in this. All right. Um, and, and again, this, this is going to come through in the, in that time that you spend with them, with your initial consultation is you let them know you can trust me on this and I'm going to help you to make the, make the uh, changes and the goals that you're, that you've given me. We're going to get you, get you through that. So that's, that's what I have normally so, so, to do is impress so, upon so them. Just pretty much tell them, Hey, look, um, I'm here for you. Just trust me. I'm going to work, work you through that. That's, that's the, so, uh, Austin, does that help? It does. Yeah, definitely. It kind of helps put things into perspective. That's great. Thank you guys. Yeah. You thank you so it. much for being a part of it. Okay. For sure. All right. See ya. Um, so Doug, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's funny that, um, you know, there's so many things that, that we do that play a role as a trainer. And, and, you know, I, I think, gosh, trainer, when you sit back and you think about all the duties, right. So, uh, you know, I think about this because we have different departments in the company and different teams and stuff like that. And, and the different companies, and they have to focus on like one specific thing right? Like they, they, they do this thing, but realistically, um, you know, trainers, you know, trainers out there, um, 
They're doing so they much. A, they got a lot to do. We're doing so much. Like when you're a trainer, I, I, I almost think like if you can be a really good trainer, like you're like the jack of all trades to some degree because mm -hmm. you're, you're like coaching them through the workouts. Now, when I say really good, I'm talking about when you're a really good trainer, like you're getting client results. Uh, they're coming back. You've got a good book of business. You're making a good living. And, you know, um, so just a, it's just a lot. And it's, it's, it's incredible. I, I mean, it, yeah. I, it really is. So uh, great yeah. question. Awesome. Thanks for bringing that. Let's move on. We've got, um, and I see next up, uh, uh, Louisa, Louisa Scott, uh, we're going to get to you next. Thanks for the question. We'll be right with you. We're going to jump over to Elizabeth. Okay. Bannon, Banman, uh, Elizabeth Banman uh, from, man, I don't, I don't even know where this is. <laughs> what? Where, wow. where is that? Where is that, Doug? Wow. I got to put, is that Canada? On. Holy is, cow. Is that, is that Canada? I don't know. Um, is the national, okay. This is a question. Is the national exam based on the things already learned in the BDU modules? So a uh, great question. I'm going to answer that real quick and we'll move on. But basically, uh, the answer to your question is yes, there is a uh, most of the stuff that we do in the modules is going to prepare you, Elizabeth, for the national exam, but that's not where it stops. You definitely have to go through the uh, chapter by chapter review that we have on YouTube, the study guide that we have, um, and the the um, this is is this NASM or ACE? She doesn't put here. She just puts national exam. So um, uh, the uh, the textbook. So you're going to have all the tools that you need. But the BDU is going to kind of cover some of the stuff and lead you up to uh, helping with that. Thanks for that uh, question. Um, let's bounce over to uh, Louisa. Louisa Scott. Okay, uh, Louisa. I'm going to send you a notification where uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and fire away. Ask your question. Tell us where you're from. Hi, this is Luisa. I'm in North Carolina, but I'm from Mexico. <laughs> welcome. Oh, welcome. Welcome, Luisa, from North Carolina. What part of North Carolina? Cary. Oh, beautiful up there. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> All right, so, tell us what you got. Um, my question is if um, weight training is recommended for pregnant women. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and the answer to that really quickly is... Absolutely, without a doubt, definitely, positively, <laughs> guaranteed, yes, um, weight training. Um, a matter of fact, um, I have uh, the fortune of being able to train, I don't even know, Louisa, probably, I'm going to say maybe two dozen pregnant women through their entire pregnancy. Uh, uh, and some would come in during their pregnant, while they were pregnant, but some uh, before, during, and, and after. And um, I saw hands down. Now, sometimes there were scenarios where they couldn't do it. There were some complications or something like that. But if everything is good and they're healthy, um, mo most doctors today too are going to recommend it. You got to be careful with the heart rate and the zone that you're going to train them in. But when you when you when you talk about weight training, oh, absolutely. Matter of fact, I always saw the clients, the the women that I trained that were pregnant, bounce back much faster when they uh, develop their lean body mass, because once the bait, once they're, they deliver, they have, um, they have all this uh, lean body mass uh, that's going to burn more calories uh, than fat. And what I found is that when I would develop their uh, lean body mass after they gave birth, they would bounce back so quick versus, you know, somebody that uh, did not exercise with weight training uh, throughout the process and then came in and just tried to get back into shape after having a baby. Now that's good too, but if you do weight training throughout the process, so absolutely. Doug, what can you add on there for her? Um, the only thing of course, as, and I'll just throw in the, the contraindications to it is depends on the trimester that you're in. There are obvious hormonal endocrine changes that a woman goes through increases in a couple of hormones. Relaxin is the main hormone that, that tends to, um, you know, it increase the laxity of joints. So again, um, what I've always done and Cor what Corey has always done now, we've, we got good at it, but I would always, always ask, ask the uh, client, um, to get the doctor's, uh, information and approval, um, for different exercises. Cause I don't want, I always want a physician. If you're under the care of a physician to tell me, look, you didn't do all the blood work. You didn't do all the things on this client. So you may want to be careful with A, B, C, and D. 99.99% of the time as a, as a woman moves through first, second, and into the third trimester, the total amount of weight you're going to use is probably going to go down. And of course, I'm always going to rely on what 
uh, what she is telling me, uh, because there are very clear, very clear physiological changes that occur through the course of the pregnancy, like Corey said, heart rate changes. It's all because of the the crazy way that the uh, that the female endocrine system during pregnancy and and then postpartum is going to is going to affect their training capabilities. But but the question of do it, absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Louisa. Let me ask you: um, Are you currently training clients that are pregnant? Are you getting ready to? Well, actually, I'm, I just started the program and I'm pregnant. <laughs> so, ah, <laughs> okay, okay. But I was worried yeah. because I usually do weight training, but I didn't know uh, if it was safe, like to increase that weight and oh, yeah. if it was recommended. I know yeah. it's safe to work out and all. Yeah. So uh, yeah. There, there's been generally three main things uh, with the weight training is just making, you know, uh, wearing a heart rate monitor. So when I trained uh, pregnant women, they always wore a heart rate monitor and uh, they would always wear a heart rate monitor. And I didn't really like taking them above, you know, 70%. Uh, I always keep them kind of below uh, about 70% there's all different uh, percentages that are shared out there. That's what I use. Um, you know, I've never put them on their back. Uh, so during uh, core ab exercise, not, you're not going to put anyone on the back. Uh, if you're doing small group training, when I had other clients doing core and ab exercises, I'm going to have them doing things like planks, um, the external rotation too, of, of literally bringing their shoulders back because of the weight that they're carrying and, and bringing forward. We do a, a lot of that kind of work, but um, absolutely uh, for yourself and for your future clients, uh, do weight training. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much for that question. Um, so Doug, uh, you know, I, um, I remember, I remember a couple clients, like two of them specifically. And I, I can I share their names if, if I don't share their last name is, would that be? Yeah, sure. It? Sure. So I had a client, uh, her name was Shelly. Uh, and she was a beast. Shelly literally, um, uh, she trained and I think, and I'm, I'm not positive, but I think like after the last workout, three days later, she gave birth. Like that's, <laughs> I mean, she trained and, literally and literally right up to it. Yes. And then as soon as she felt like she had healed uh, enough, she came back in, we took it real slow, but she bounced back so quick. And I'm, I remember her telling me, uh, you know, how she responded much differently because this was her second child when she, because she did that versus not doing the weight training. And so, you know, there's so many benefits to it. Um, the one thing is, is kind of bouncing back, but just, you know, I think overall it just improves the, ex the, the experience for the, for the pregnancy. And, and remember there's a, there's another part of this that we, that we don't normally, that we don't, don't normally bring into the equation and that's nutrition. Because again, remember mm. the, the pregnant woman that is concerned and exercises and trains is probably the same woman that says, I'm not going to have ice cream and pickles, even though yeah. I'm craving it. So, yeah, true. So there's a lot, there's a lot to um, getting, getting a pregnant, uh, a woman that's pregnant into that psychological mindset that you need to, you, you don't, how should I say this nicely? You don't just get to do whatever you want to do right? Just because you're pregnant. Yeah. it's not the best thing. And um, so many like you, I've trained so many um, women uh, at different stages of pregnancy and, and, and after they've given birth, and that mindset of, I actually want to do what's best. So I'm not going to acquiesce and eat whatever I want to. Um, and you know, right. this with my with my wife, she was, a, you know, she's a national level competitive bodybuilder. She gained, mm. I'm, I think I've told you this, her both of our girls, she gained no more than 15 pounds with yeah. both of them, 12 for one, 15 for the other. Why? Because she, she followed her uh, pediatrician's obvious advice. But and she's a genetic a, beast. That too. But, but she, she basically said, I'm not going to eat the way I want to eat. I'm going to eat mm -hmm. what's good for me and for my baby. Um, and, and so, yeah, those are the other things to consider. It's not just the training. Um, it's the same thing when we talk about the average person. It's the same thing with pregnant women, special populations. The nutrition is still is still a critical part of this. Just don't stop yeah. exercising. Don't stop exercising. You don't need to unless your doctor is yeah. a caveat, unless your doctor says you need to stop. All right. Doug, um, you know that it wasn't long ago 
it wasn't long ago because when I first started training, doctors were what they were not recommending exercise to pregnant women. No, um, and no. it's unbelievable. Now it's it's very common. And the younger the doctors, you know, they're they're recommending it. But uh, it wasn't long ago that they kind of they feared There's it. enough and, research. Yeah, There's so much research out there at this point. It's kind of and we have enough. We have enough. Uh, real world experience with this. Um, yeah. As well. Okay, guys. Um, uh, again, Louisa, thanks for that question. Um, and thanks for being a part of it. So we've got a couple, we're running out of time here. Got a couple other questions. We're going to answer uh, real quick and uh, we're going to call it a wrap. Uh, thank you everyone for being a part of uh, this talk and contributing and, and bringing your questions. Uh, this question from Corey. Okay. Corey without an E. Okay. Corey <laughs> to born in uh, Illinois uh, asked, what is your best advice for getting clients online? What is your best advice for getting clients online? Um, getting clients online for in-person training or getting clients online for online training? Um, I'm thinking online it, training probably. The answer is the same. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, just write it down. Have you ever heard, heard <laughs> Facebook, <laughs> Instagram? Now, with that being said, we're getting ready to play with TikTok. We are getting ready to play with TikTok a little bit. And when I say that, I'm talking about from an advertising standpoint, okay? But Facebook and Instagram right now, definitely without a doubt. Google, uh, those are your three. Uh, and because Facebook owns Instagram, you're, it's just one platform. You could advertise for both to get clients. Google would be your next. But you're only going to use Google if you're searching for clients online that are going to train in person. You don't use Google for online training. Use Facebook for both in-person and online uh, clients, okay? You use uh, Google for in-person uh, clients because it's geographically, it's searched and, and that's what it is. Uh, next time I can, if you bring it back next week, I can we can dive into it a little bit more, but thanks for your question there. And then um, we've got Mohammed uh, from Ontario. What should price, what should price my services at? What should I price my services at? Um, so a great question. Um, this, uh, varies. Um, when you say services, uh, as a personal trainer, you can mean a lot. Um, meaning like, is it small group training, personal training? Is it, uh, online? Is it in person? Is it one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, is it independent? Is it at a gym? Um, so if you come back, make that question a little bit more detailed, I can dive a little bit deeper for you and, and give you some assistance for those of you that want to know how to price your service. I'm going to give you a real general. Okay just a real general. Generally speaking, um, and I could dive into this more, online training, uh, we're preferring a high ticket uh, program. That's what we're seeing uh, to be the most effective, anywhere between $1,500 and $2,500. Between $1,500 and $2,500, an online program that is self-paced, good stuff for online training. In-person training, one-on-one, -on -one, no less than $50. Okay. I generally would say for client for trainers that are trying to get started and trying to fill their schedule uh, just make sure that all your costs are covered um, that you don't lowball yourself you uh, price yourself and value yourself higher uh, I've always told uh, trainers in the past what do you think you're worth what do you think you'd want to charge when they asked me what should I charge what do you think you 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 would want to charge and they'd say uh, XYZ I'd say well just add like 50 percent to that I don't know why, but most trainers, like they, they undersell themselves, but generally speaking, one-on-one -on -one training around the U S now in Manhattan, LA and different places, it's much more, but generally $50, uh, starting is a good starting point for one-on-one -on -one training, no less than $50 and for small group training, no less than 30. Those are the two marks, uh, small group training being about five or more people. And then you work up from there. Then you just work up from there. General rule of thumb is uh, we would increase the session rates five dollars every year, um, and uh, there's some co some conditions to that, and we can talk about that at another time. But um, uh, Doug, I think I those were both business, so I just knocked them out. Is that okay? You you did it, man. Guys, thank you so much for being a part of this uh, personal trainer talk. I hope uh, some of the stuff that we shared uh, is helpful to you and we wish you the absolute best. Let's leave them this week with one thing, uh, Doug, that we want them to focus on with their clients. Maybe something that uh, we kind of uh, talked about in this talk, but if there's one thing that we would want them to do and really focus on as a goal this week in their business until next Wednesday, what do you think? 
Um, I would think uh, what I had said to Austin, which is make sure, make sure your clients know that your level of interest in their goals and accomplishing their goals is at the highest level. And they truly, truly believe that. And make sure that you've got that um, as a main goal. Wake up in the morning and that's what you're thinking about, right? Make sure your clients know that you are interested in them accomplishing their goals. And, okay. You know, and it's, and it's one thing, I think that's awesome. And it's one thing to say that to a client. Okay, it's one thing to say, it, it's one thing to mean it, it's one thing to live it, it's one thing to do it. So when Doug says that, we're talking about when a client says, I want to lose this, I want to gain this, I want to feel this. As soon as they say that to you, you take ownership of it. So you act like it's your own goal. Do you want to achieve your own goals? Well, you when that client sits with you and they write you a check or they give you a credit card and they pay you, what we're saying is as soon as they do that and they tell you their goals, you own those goals. And when you do that, they're going to feel that it's more important to you at times than it is even to them. Guys, thank you so much again. Have a great week. We wish you all the best. Every Wednesday, 2 p.m., be here. Personal Trainer Talk. Peace out. See ya.